Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Cancer Focus Week. I'm extremely fortunate today to have my good friend, Michelle Allen, from Monkey's House Senior Dog Hospice and Sanctuary in New Jersey, joining me. Um, Michelle and I have spent a lot of years working together, and when I was in New Jersey, uh, Michelle and I would see a lot of each other at my clinics, at Monkey's House, at events, kind of all the time. Uh, <laughs> yep. So, so we're lucky because we get along and we're friends um, in addition to having a professional relationship. So thanks, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Appreciate, I appreciate you too. So um, because we're doing a cancer focus week, I really wanted to speak with you about palliative care and hospice care as it revolves around cancer. Um, so as you know, my little guy, George, has urinary tract cancer right now. He has transitional cell carcinoma in his bladder and uh, in his urethra. He also has a soft tissue sarcoma on his um, chest under the skin. And I am opting for palliative care. We are not in hospice care because he's not dying. He's a very happy little man. Uh, but palliative care means I am not trying to cure him. I am trying to, I mean, if the cancer went away, oh my gosh, that would be like, woohoo. But if it doesn't and it remains inactive, it remains stable, or maybe it regresses a little bit, I'm a really happy person because George is really happy right now. So even at the stage where we are, he's really happy. Um, so how many of, I mean, first of all, how many dogs have gone through Monkey's House. And how long has Monkey's House been in existence? It's like eight We've years? It's been in existence for since 2015, so eight years. Uh, about 150 dogs have come through our doors. And these are all seniors for the most part. You've had one or two that sneak in that are youngsters um, that have life-ending diagnoses. But um, of that 150 dogs, what percentage would you say either came with cancer? I don't think there are too many who develop cancer while they live with you, but a lot of them come with cancer, right? I would say I would say more than half come with cancer. Um, tequila developed cancer while he was with us, um, hemangiosarcoma. And, okay. um, you know, they're starting to look at Lyme disease and hemangiosarcoma. And he had Lyme twice um, that was caught quick and treated. But uh, I and I really thought we would have more better success with him because he was already, he was not stressed. He was not in a shelter. He was being fed well. Um, for the most part though, it's more like we discover the cancer and it's just part of why their blood work, their inflammatory blood work was so inflammatory. And it's just that we located it. Right. Go from there. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like with George, like I knew there was something bad going on. It just took me a while to find it because yeah. uh, no blood markers for his particular cancer, which we find the same thing with tumors of the spleen, like hemangiosarcoma, heart-based tumors. You know, you may have perfectly normal lab work this morning and your dog falls down bleeding out this afternoon. I mean, it's just, unfortunately, that's how some of these cancers are. Yeah. So... Give me a couple of examples of dogs. Like I'm thinking of a couple, right? And I want you to tell their stories a little bit and their cancers that they had and what, what was done for them. One, Harley, because she had multiples. And the other one, was it Hannah that had the really bad mammary tumors? Yes. yes. All right. So let's talk about them. Let's talk about Harley first. Harley was a huge dog. Yeah. Harley Harley was a 120-pound Malmix, Malmute mix. And sweet loving girl pale white gums a huge basketball hanging off of her side another one hanging lower down um, she had a big hock and she had giant mammary masses and we have a lot of criteria for getting into monkey's house and she was one of the dogs i was confident you would approve for joining <laughs> if you have enough cancer she can get in <laughs> yes yes um but you know in planning uh what to do for her uh you know, everything had to be staged. Um, we did not do chemo and radiation. We did a fresh diet. We did herbs. We did Chinese herbs. Um, we did the keto diet. And she was our first keto diet dog. And actually, she was also in a great forever foster home. And I was having troubles with the math, reaching out to you for help with the math. And the foster mom, the three, 
the two of us and the dog both did, all three did the keto diet. And that was very helpful because um, you can't fudge in, in ketosis. You, you can't. So if the dog doesn't want to eat, you, you can't offer them graham crackers. You have to think of other resources. Um, so it was helpful for us to say what, what smells good that's made of fat, what's, what's not going to pull her out that we could do to stimulate her appetite. Um, it was helpful in, particip- in doing that with her. But your plan, your plan was to work on her anemia, um, get her some good nourishment, even though she was overweight, she was actually malnourished. Um, and then the first thing we did was take off the, the 14 and a half pound cheese ball that was on her side. But if I remember correctly, when by the time, because it took a month or two to get her ready. Yes. And the reason we had to do the surgery, it was like this 14 pound tumor that was on her side. She couldn't lay on that side. Mm-hmm. When she walked, she was sort of listing in that direction. Like mm-hmm. it really was throwing her off. It wasn't necessarily painful. It was just really throwing her off and affecting her mobility and, and ability to just, you know, lay down on one side. Yes. Um, so do you remember how long it was from the time she came in to the time we went to surgery? I think, I think actually it was three months. Oh, yeah. It, was- it seemed like it was a while because we wanted to get her um, nutrition better. We wanted to get some weight off um, while building up, building up muscle and decreasing fat. Yes. Um, but I remember when you brought her for surgery, you said it's the weirdest thing. Her mammary tumors are shrinking. Shrinking and some of them were completely gone. It was, that was something you could just see. And, and you know, when, when people are doing something they think prevents cancer, you can't see it working. You can't see it helping. Um, when you're doing something that slows the growth of cancer, you can't see it. Um, this was like, wow, where'd they go? Like, you know what I mean? Like I said, is this me? Is this me? You know, it was, that was that was pretty that was pretty wild. It was. It was pretty awesome. Uh, and I remember you brought her in in the day of surgery. I was like feeling her other lumps and I was like, wow, this this is pretty cool. But it wasn't just the keto diet because you have a whole just like I mean, my poor little George, I did my thing on him. And, you know, it's like here's his 25 things I'm mm-hmm. adding into his bit of food. Um, so what are some of the other things that you would incorporate for a dog like that, that we're getting ready for surgery and we're trying to slow things down? If we're getting them ready for surgery. Nutrition and exercise, even even with a 14 and a half pound ball on their side, find a way to do exercise, whether it's a treadmill, mill, a swimming pool, movement, just just movement. So critical. Um, hydration is so important. Um, and then the, the great thing about using nutrition and specifically TCVM um, is it gives you something to do while you're waiting for something else. So, you know, hitting her hard with mushrooms, with antioxidants, trying to minimize the free radicals, trying to take away all the things that was making it hard for her body to survive. When we can eat organic, our body is not fighting the toxins that are in it. When, you know, when we can eat balanced, our body is getting the nutrients it needs and not taking something from one organ to balance another. It's, it's, it makes it easy for our body to do the amazing work that it can do when it's taken care of. Right. Yeah. It's just a matter of giving it a chance. Yep. So, so those are the things we talk about really for every cancer case. Like you're pretty much not going to go wrong by throwing in some cancer fighting mushrooms, throwing in some berries for antioxidants, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the dark leafy greens, even with the keto diet, we still need a percentage of fiber in there. We still need, um, a, a, a balanced, um, vitamin mineral balance. So we've, we've got to get those B vitamins and those things that we may not be getting from the proteins and fats that we're, that we're putting in the meal. So we got her through the first surgery yes. and then I, I feel like d- we did go back and get some mammary tumors, right? So we needed to spay her. Um, we, right. we needed to spay her and you did take off two memory, two, two, two memory masses. And at the same time, you removed a, um, this one was just the size of a baseball, and it was on it was on her hock, and that came back as bone cancer that was in her tendon. Um, Very weird. So, so she had so she had three. We were working with three different kinds of cancer. Um, yeah, and I want to address because some people are going to say, "Why would you spay this old dog with three kinds of cancer?" Well, you have to understand that in a 
place like monkey's house or she was in foster care but there were a lot of other uh dogs there as well um it becomes really difficult to have a bunch of unspayed and unneutered michelle has had up to what 28 dogs living in your house at any one time (laughs) more (laughs) so um you know it becomes a, a management issue um and a lot of times uh because we we are um, we are all for having our dogs remain intact as long as possible. However, sometimes with other situations, we have to we have to look at you know what's for the greater good. So, uh, so it wasn't a, a bad thing to go when ahead and they do have that. cancer. It's a different it's a different ball game. Yeah. The other thing, the other yeah. reason we spay in this case is because just removing the hormones that the ovaries produce gets you know you know slows down the growth slows down what's feeding the, the mammary cancer and also reduces the risk of pyometra. Pyometra is a medical emergency and um, there's not an emergency clinic in the world that would do surgery on, on my dogs. Um, on the 120 pound three cancer. Yeah. Dog. They're, they, they're just not going to do it. Um, so I need, I need to keep, you know, I, I need to, you know, we didn't just do the surgery to do the surgery. We did the surgery right. when the blood work, when the x-rays, when she met the criteria for being as healthy as she could be to survive it. And we had very good reason that we could attain a good quality of life after. We don't do it just to do it. But in the face of mammary cancer, man, getting that, getting them spayed, fully spayed is my, my highest priority at that time. Yeah, and it's interesting because there's still a lot of research going on about um, estrogen receptors and what role those play in mammary cancer in dogs, uh, just like in people. Mm-hmm. There are some cancers that are very estrogen responsive, and there are some that are not estrogen responsive. Mm-hmm. And we don't always know which we're dealing with without some really intense testing. Um, so in this sort of case, it's like, okay, well, we'll we'll take care of this. And the thing is, spaying her and removing her mammary masses, the mammary masses, and we didn't do lymph nodes, we didn't do radical mastectomies. And that was not a problem for her after that. The mammary tumors were kind of like, you know, no big deal. And we got rid of the big baseball on one side and we had gotten rid of the 14 pound basketball on the other side. So the dog was really, really much more comfortable. Um, What what was her final cause of death? I, I do believe over time um, that she uh, that it had spread to her lungs. That the cancer had spread to her lungs. She, which was probably the one from the the bone cancer from the tendon. Yeah, and she sadly was a dog that was getting distressed riding in the car. And for me, it could be the day before I'm going to euthanize. If I'm worried that the cancer has spread to their lungs, I want to grab an x-ray to make sure. Because just because they have cancer doesn't mean they can't get every other single thing that any other healthy dog can't get. And and they can respond with with treatment. Um, But she, it it was stressing her out being in the car. So she never came for an x-ray. And she was headed towards respiratory distress. And so we chose in-home euthanasia. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is a smart thing, but how long did Harley stay with monkeys? Well, 19 months, 19 months. months. So this is a dog who came with three cancers and had 19 months of phenomenal existence. She had a little boy who loved her dearly in the foster home and she had a great life. And I mean, she only went through, I think the two surgical procedures during that period of time and they were fairly early on and then she had a really good quality of life and so that's how important palliative care can be we can slow down cancers we can shrink cancers it doesn't mean we're going to beat them every time and that's not really even our goal in palliative care Um, it's what would that dog have gotten if she had surgery chemo and radiation versus what she got with uh, supportive care, palliative care, and trying to slow things down. So let's talk about Hannah Bear. Hannah Banana. You know, I remember when I brought her into you, you said you weren't sure if she was part Mexican hairless or Chinese crested. Um, she had hair from the fa- from her face forward and some wispies on her tail. The rest of her was just nasty skin disease. And open draining mammary masses. She was a stray off the streets of Philly. 
And she was a sad sack. She was, she was a sad sack. Um, her memory masses were so big. She was a Pomeranian. I should start with that. She, she was a little dog and her masses were so big that when you examined her, you said there was no way that you could remove them and have skin left to close. And I never want to do a surgery that they're not going to heal from. I want to minimize the surgeries where I'm going to lose them to complications after. We're very cautious. We, we do big surgeries, but we do them being very aware of what we're doing and the risks that we're taking. And because there wasn't going to be enough skin to actually close her chest where she would just have an incision, um, we opted, you formulated the plan to do neoplasing first. And uh, so she came to the office for neoplasing treatments where the cancer, and it's just this black icky, it looks like motorcycle oil. <laughs> it's a black icky paste. It's just this icky paste, <laughs> put it on with a tongue depressor, and we just kept dressings on her. And she would go through the equivalent of three to six maxi pads a day. I had band net around her, like a t-shirt. So that was kind of, it wasn't tight, but it was for a minute. And just changing the drainage, just catching the drainage um, as it ate the cancer cells. Um, the week of her surgery, her surgery was scheduled for a Thursday. And that Monday she stopped eating and I couldn't get her to start eating. And I thought, oh crap. Um, and I called you and uh, you said, you know, do what you can and we'll just really examine her well on, on Thursday. Um, prior to this, you had done a chest X-ray and it was clear. There was no meds to the lungs. Um, that morning, we did an exam. We redid her blood work. Her organ function was still good. The chest X-ray was not so good. There was, there was a little bit of some concern uh, in, in one spot. In a, in a, I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to say the plural space, but it's, there's a the, the, pulmonary parenchyma. That whatever. was the word. That's the word. Um, anyway, you told me it was the, the game. It was this, the decision was mine that there was no wrong answer. Um, I, I really, she was really not wanting to eat. She, she had not been a ball of fire when she came, but, uh, she was getting lethargic. Um, and I really thought we were going to be losing her soon, maybe euthanizing her. And so I felt at that moment like I, like we had nothing to lose. And I asked if I could hold her while you guys, you know, gave her the knockout shot. And you said yes. And I was grateful for that. That gave me the guts to say, let's do this. Um, because it would be the same thing I would have done for her had we chosen euthanasia at a, at a later date. So... Um, she had her surgery. She came out of it with a completely straight incision. I mean, stem to stern, but you did a, like, you could have been a plastic surgeon in another life. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful thing. Her skin, I'll come back as that. Her skin, closed, her skin <laughs> healed. And within two days, this quiet, polite, lethargic dog was not only eating, she started chasing my poor cat. I mean, Every day chasing, chasing the cat. And you know how you say, keep them quiet. Don't let them climb stairs. <laughs> yeah. You know, thanks. Um, you know, she, and, and I think just not having all of the stuff draining out of her body, all the stuff sucking the energy. Also her white count, I think at that point was 79,000. And we were concerned about pyometra brewing. Um, we were, we were just, you can't tell at that point what's cancer, what's infection. You know, you just have to, do your best. And so I had decided that we had done as much as, as much as we could do from this side. So I needed to leave it in, in your, in your hands for surgery and, and hope for the best. And the best was another two years with the sweetest, craziest, most insane, happy little girl that you could imagine. I mean, just incredible. Her hair grew back very quickly. Um, her appetite was Never a problem after that. Um, later in life, uh, it did spread to her lungs. And at that point, um, her respirations were starting to increase. Her, even her resting respirations were starting to increase. And when they were starting to increase into the 40s and she was looking tired all the time, we did opt at that point for euthanasia. But 
that was two years of letting her see the good side of people and two years yeah, exactly. of all of us having the honor of loving her. Yep. So basically all of the dogs, so we've got half of the dogs coming to monkey's house have cancer. Do you have some that, um, their tumors are not surgical. And so there is no surgical intervention. It's just support with diet and supplements. Yeah. We have some, we have some that we can't get them well enough for surgery. So it is just support with diet and supplements. And even then longevity predictions, like they, they, they mean nothing to me. People ask me how old the dog is. I just, I just did a post saying, just pull the 700 year old dog. It doesn't matter how old they are. It matters how happy they are, how, how much function they have left of their body and what we can fix or what we can support to give them a good quality. So I've had several, um, LA comes to mind. L LA came to mind. She uh, started with hemangiosarcoma. And then while I was away, she had a high grade mast cell tumor explode <laughs> while I was on vacation. Um, that was also, she had her first bleed while I was on vacation, my poor volunteers. Um, and really she was so grateful to have love and food and it, she hung on for a, a very long time um, when there really was not much we could do for, for her, for what was wrong with her body. We supported what we could and we loved her and included her in everything we did. Exactly. So when we're talking about palliative care and hospice, we are not talking about prolonging a suffering life. Yeah. We are talking about providing the care that they need to have fun and enjoyment. And they're not 100% healthy. Do you have anybody in your house who's 100% healthy? Not, Maybe your your own personal my, dog. My own personal dog. He's he's in pretty decent shape. Um, he's only two. And I would say our ducks. <laughs> the ducks. <laughs> our ducks are in good shape. <laughs> yeah, even your kitty cats are. Uh, let's see, you've got Grandpa who's hundred. He's a hundred, I think. He's a hundred, and then you have the kitty cat who was the stray cat who adopted you and was missing and came yes. back ill. How's that one doing? She's she's doing well for her. Um, she came back for her. She, she's been here for over 10 years and I've, I've only been able to touch her when one time when she was shot and, uh, this time when her pelvis was broken. And, uh, so she is living in a, in a big suite air conditioning, she's got air conditioning. She's got, she's got the works and she's starting to actually climb up things to rest. Um, and you know, her one leg wasn't moving forward at all. It was only dragging. And now the hip moves forward. The only thing that's happening is that she is knuckling at the paw, but the hip is moving forward. Um, Give it enough so, time. You know, we'll see what happens. It's just a matter of supporting them. Um, you, you know, and, and absolutely, you know, she saw my vet. She had x-rays. We did pain meds. Like when I talk about these stories for the cat that you can't touch, it's so much fun. I, I actually gave her two baths, not fun, <laughs> but you know, there's always support through this. There's always pain. Pain is something that's very important to us that we manage. And, um, someone was saying to me that we run more of a rehab here. And I said, we do a lot of rehab, but rehab decreases their pain, increases their independence. It's, it's really a gift. And it really does help starve out cancer cells when, they're, when their body is working and, you know, their muscles is working and their, their oxygen is going towards energy output versus feeding the cancer. Um, so we do a lot of rehab, but it's, it's part of our palliative care plan. I've heard so many people say, I can't afford $4,000 for this, for this cancer protocol or for this, for this chemo. I, all I have is palliative care. And I think they think that means doing nothing until their dog is dying. And that there's nothing further from the, from, from that. And yeah, palliative care is active participation. It is very active. Um, and it is, it, it's yeah. a matter of changing the way you think and changing the way you make plans. Uh, and it helps you travel this journey a lot closer with your dog. Um, 
you know, a, a lot of a lot of cancer protocols, you know, you have four weeks of this and then two weeks of this and then you're done a protocol. This is nothing about hanging in there for six weeks. This is about today is awesome and we did this many things. Um, so where we might need to rest a little bit from today's awesomeness. If not, we're hitting awesome again. <laughs> um, so we do an awful lot to keep the dogs active, to keep them included in everything, to keep them engaged. Um, when it comes to quality of life, when their body is failing them, we do what we can to bring quality to them. So we had a big German shepherd down on our forest. We put him in a wagon. He went for his walks in the wagon. He would bark at everyone speeding like you wouldn't believe. Like, like, there's just, there's ways <laughs> to interact. Um, and nutrition, having access to the knowledge of nutrition and how to change their diets to slow the growth of cancer. And for me, many people talk about conquering cancer. I, I pray someday they do. For me, I feel that um, I've, I've done my best job if they live long enough to die from something else. Um, I want to quiet it. I want it to, I want it to become a, one more thing so that, you know, when, you, when you're at the doctor's office and you say you're allergic to penicillin, um, you have GERD, you know, I, I want it to just be like another just innocuous thing that you just say. And it's not, you know, it's not the main focus of your life because that is not at all the main focus of their life. Their main focus of their life is having an awesome day. There you go. It's all about having awesome days and trying to string as many awesome days as possible together yes. so yes. that you have an awesome yes. life. Yes. Thank you for everything that you do, Thank Michelle. You. Thank you. And the other thing is, uh, not only are you doing it for the dogs in your care, but, and, and cats now, uh, you're not a hospice for cats. You just happen to have a few cats because you're allergic to cats. Allergic. These cats just insist. Yeah. They just insist on being there, which is cool. Um, but not only do you take care of the dogs that are under your direct care and supervision, but you have helped so many people through your monkey's house page, through the books that Jeff has written, your husband, um, where dogs go to live, by the way, is a great book, um, that Jeff wrote talking about the care that these, that these dogs get and some of the things that can be done. Um, and you've helped so many people. You're on so many, uh, different social media pages, helping people navigate this, and that's critical because if we have knowledge and you've gained so much knowledge from these dogs, every one of these dogs teaches you something. I know they do because every one of my patients taught me something and my dogs continue to, and my cats continue to teach me things. So, um, and you're, you're just so kind with sharing your knowledge and helping people where you can and kind of meeting them at their level, which is, is really critical. And I appreciate that more than you know. Thank you. Thank you. I think from being a human nurse, um, teaching and empowering people to understand what's wrong with them and what medicines they're taking and the risks of what medicine they're taking and the, the benefits of the surgery they want to have, the, the benefits of not having surgery they want to have. I think that that makes makes me hard. It's hard to shut me up. Um, and, um, <laughs> I, you know, for as many dogs, more than one in two over the age of 10 are getting can a cancer diagnosis. Um, you know, it, no one is ever, oh, okay, thank you. Um, you know, when do you want to see us again? The, you know, it's, I, I think of this um, volcano movie where, um, Tommy Lee Jones is hanging on a fire ladder by on a fire truck by his hands and the ladder is starting to melt and they're trying to pull him over lava. And there's a patient that they just rescued on the end of this and his feet are on fire and the ladder can't move any faster. And Tommy Lee Jones is saying, hold on, hold still. And like they're trying to slowly get across the lava. And that is the closest I can describe the level of stress you feel when you're told your dog has cancer, even if it's cancer of a toenail, <laughs> um, yeah. it, it, it puts you in, in not a good state. Uh, and that has been, it's been so important to me to support people in knowing that there's hope that 
you, you do need a vet in your life. You absolutely do need a vet in your life. People say, oh, from here on out, it's just hospice. I, I'm, no more vets. You cut a deal with your vet where you say, no more vets because my dog freaks out in your waiting room. You know, can you see my dog in my car? Or, you know, can we do some of this by telehealth? Or can we do something else? But you need, you need a vet. You need a vet in your, in your life. Um, but you also need to know that when you're, when you're hanging onto that ladder and you're about to drop into lava and the ladder is bending, that there is hope. You, you need to catch your breath. You need to be okay because if all you're doing is focusing on cancer, your dog's life is already over. You, you need to focus on working through this together. Love that. Absolutely love that. Thank you very much, Michelle. I'm sure we'll be chatting again very Thank soon. Thank you for this great opportunity. Have an awesome day.